the Nintendo 64 has 393 licensed games. And I'm going to play them all. British game developers Rare had one of those struck gold partnerships with Nintendo in the late 90s in a collaboration which has been rarely seen since. They were given access to develop some of Nintendo's intellectual properties which gave birth to the Donkey Kong Country series of games, Donkey Kong 64, Diddy Kong Racing and Star Fox Adventures. But they managed to stake their claim on a corner of the gaming world with the development of their own titles. GoldenEye 007, Jet Force Gemini, Perfect Dark, Blast Corps, just to name a few. But the title which I personally am most thankful for, and I feel a lot of other gamers would feel the same sentiment towards, is the unlikely duo of Bird and Bear, Banjo-Kazooie. Uh -huh. 3D open level platforming wasn't the newest thing in late 1998. Super Mario 64, released two years earlier, really laid the blueprint of what these games should be, and other titles such as Gex and Croc on the PlayStation added to the ever-expanding library of the genre. But what stopped Banjo-Kazooie from being relegated into the annals of obscurity was its pure charm. Now I may be biased considering Rare and I are both British, but what's so expertly executed is that level of dry wit and humour and sarcasm that just permeates throughout the entire game. And I'm still finding new things to laugh at as a 30 year old than what I did when I was a kid. I got this game for my 8th birthday. Now, something you need to know about me is I'm born on September 3rd, which coincidentally is the beginning of the school year. So every birthday was the first day back at school. So there I am in my uniform, getting ready, and my mom gives me this box at breakfast and I open it and it's Banjo-Kazooie. And I've been wanting this game for months. I had a guide and it was Yoshi's Story and Banjo-Kazooie and I'd read it back to front even though I didn't have the game. I just loved looking at the pictures, I just loved looking at the colours of the different levels and finally I got to have it and I got to play it and I got to play it for 30 minutes before I went to school and I'll never forget loading it up and seeing that dragonfly fly past and then you're at this picnic and Banjo just pops up and pulls out a banjo and then everybody joins in and it was like attending a little picnic party on my birthday and going out into spiral mountain for that tutorial stage talking to bottles a sentient mole learning different moves to attack sentient vegetables it was just crazy the story was simple banjo's sister Tootie has been kidnapped by an evil witch and so her brother and his best friend Kazooie who resides in his backpack need to travel through different worlds collecting jiggies and notes in order to try and save her. Brewing a meta commentary on gaming on behalf of Rare, the stakes were never that high. The reason for the kidnapping wasn't enslavement or killing or anything like that, it was because Gruntilda was ugly and she wanted to steal Tootie's beauty. And so this ridiculous premise of a plot, it took the pressure off you. It didn't make it a world changing event. And in fact, if you do get a game over screen, you're presented with a hilarious sequence in which in goes frumpy Gruntilda and out comes this felt supermodel. And it's that kind of energy which allows you to feel comfortable throughout the game and appreciate every last detail. The nine self-contained levels which you had to explore each had their own unique design and concept. And the difficulty for the game rose as time went on. Take the final level, Click Clock Woods. It's centered around one core playing space, but you can revisit it at different seasons of the year. And the actions you take in one will have an effect in another. This sort of cross-world impact is a concept that was later revisited in the sequel, Banjo-Tooie. But the real heart and soul of the game lies in the colourful cast of characters. Every single thing you interact with, whether it be an overstuffed polar bear, a depressed camel, or a sobbing pirate hippo, each has its own personality and voice. And the voice acting, for want of a better term, is just inspired. The mumbling sounds that they make instantly conveys personality and character, and allows you to be quickly emotionally invested in their story without being lost in the nuances of an actor's delivery. The developers originally planned for spoken word delivery, but eventually settled on this style, and I think that was the best choice. 
With the variety of levels to explore and the roster of characters to interact with, what kept gameplay fresh was the variety of moves that you could use. You weren't given access to everything straight away and in each level you got to unlock something new, whether it be firing eggs, the power of flight, or turning Kazooie into your own personal taxi service. It just meant new ways to play the game were being drip-fed throughout. And on top of this was the transformations that you could undergo in certain levels. By collecting mumbo tokens and visiting the resident shaman, you could transform into different entities, all of which were themed to that level. You're in a swamp? You become an alligator. Find yourself near a termite hill? You better become a termite. And it just added that extra something to the game. Sure, you're already having to hone your skills playing as bird and bear, but then there's a whole new character and abilities to control as well. There are parts of the game which are very frustrating though, and I didn't realise how frustrating they were until this latest playthrough. For some reason, Rare implemented some arcade-style concepts. There's a hundred musical notes to collect in each level, but if you die, you'll respawn at the beginning of the level with a count of zero, and you'll have to go through the whole process again. Also, in later stages, if you find yourself in a very difficult position and you've worked hard to get there, if you happen to fail, you'll be sent right back to the beginning of the level and have to go through the whole thing again. It just seemed an unnecessary pressure and a pitfall to put in there. An instant respawning or a carried on note counter would have just seemed the logical thing to do. The game that we've come to know today started out very differently. Rare had been working on a title for 16 months called Project Dream. It was a role-playing game originally intended for the SNES. It had an isometric perspective and it was about a young boy called Edson who got in trouble with a bunch of pirates. When development switched to the N64, the isometric perspective and the fantasy theme were both dropped in favour of 3D graphics and a more upbeat story. Edson was first replaced by a rabbit and then by a minor side character. Banjo. The developers wanted to give Banjo upgrades throughout the game. There were certain sections they wanted wings to appear, and they're like, how can we do that? We'll just make them pop out of a backpack. And there were certain sections they wanted him to run really fast, and they thought, yes, legs popping out the bottom of his backpack would sound right as well. Eventually they just put these ideas together and created Kazooie. And so the bickering Bantuin duo was born. One aspect that was inconspicuously innovative was the implementation of the soundtrack. Each level had its own unique theme, but depending on where you were in the level meant a difference in what you heard. If you happened to go underwater, everything would sound muted, or heading into danger, there's a change of instruments. It was just a really subtle way to help guide players and really flesh out the experience. And of course, even though it's from 1998, the graphics were just impeccable. The use of textures, the animations of the characters, and for what it was at the time, it just added this level of immersion that made you want to be there. It made you want to go on these adventures. It made you want to be their best friends. The significance and importance of Banjo-Kazooie was thankfully recognised, and a few years later, the sequel Banjo-Tooie made its way to the N64. But a couple of years after that, Rare was bought out by Microsoft, and thus ended the relationship between Nintendo and the company that had brought it so much love. Another title made its way to the Banjo-Kazooie series on the Xbox, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. But it was a far departure from what made the original game so loved and cherished that it seemed to put an end to any hopes of a continuation of the series. Recent events, however, show just how loved and sorely missed this duo are. Platonic Games, a company made up of former key personnel from Rare, made a spiritual successor entitled Ukulele. And the sharing of instruments of names isn't the only similarity. For all intents and purposes, this is a Banjo-Kazooie game, just with different skins. And for a lot of players out there, this is considered the honorary third in the series. But when the bird and bear were announced to be playable characters in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, it nearly broke the internet. I remember where I was the day I found that information out. It was one of the biggest and most welcoming shocks in the gaming world. Finally, Banjo and Kazooie were making their way back to Nintendo. They were finally home, and everything just felt right. And even though the idea of a new game in the series seems very unlikely, we'll still have this charm, and this humour, and these characters, and these levels, and this difficulty, and this ridiculousness, and this fun, playing as a bunch of friends, 
beating up carrots, collecting jigsaw pieces, attempting to stop a witch's maniacal machinations in the pursuit of her own vanity. It may be over 20 years out of date, but I'm still really grateful to have an invitation to that party. Thank you so much for watching folks. This is my attempt to play through every single Nintendo 64 game, all 393 of them. So make sure you subscribe so you can follow me on the journey. If you enjoyed this, please do give it a like and leave a comment below on what you thought, whether you played the game and which game I should play next as well. But for now, my friends, luck and more to you all. I'll catch you next time.